as people are trickling in, I just want to thank everyone who's here for coming. I know it's a very busy time of the year and several overlapping conferences with this seminar. So it's great to see so many people signed up and so many people arriving as I'm speaking. Welcome to the third seminar in the Brokex Spring Seminar Series. My name is Heidi Ostbehaugen. I'm a human geographer and a professor of China studies at the University of Oslo. So Brokex is the short name for the project Brokering China's Extroversion and Ethnographic Analysis of Transnational Arbitration. It's funded by the European Research Council, so thank you to them. Our seminar series is about how China and or Chinese and global actors um, interact. And it's also about the role of brokerage in general in development processes. So our focus today is on the workers who are constructing buildings and producing the things that are consumed either locally or globally. We have with us two scholars who have studied the role of brokers in bringing out in new workers from the countryside to cities. My colleague Yunyun Zhou uh, will chair the session and introduce the panelists. So please Yunyun. Hi everyone. My name is Yunyun Zhou. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Oslo, a colleague of Heidi. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair this session today. I'm going to briefly introduce the two speakers uh, and myself, and uh, I will say a few words about uh, the general structure of our seminar today. And then we'll proceed to hear about um, Julia Trump's research and Cyril's research. Uh, at the very, very end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So our first speaker today is Julia Trump. Uh, Julia is an assistant professor of sociology at Boston College. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA from Harvard University. Uh, her research focuses on the transformation of rural China and its implications for China's economic development. She has published articles on land politics and China's shift from labor-intensive manufacturing to land-intensive urbanization. Her recent book, Beneath the China Boom, Labor, Citizenship, and the Making of a Rural Land Market was published by UC Press in 2020. Uh, and the topic of her uh, presentation today is going to be related to her new book. And our second speaker, uh, Xin Rong Ma, she is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Political Science uh, in the School of Government at Sun Yat-sen University. She obtained her PhD degree from Chinese studies uh, in the Institute of Area Study at Leiden University. Her PhD research concerns the co-ethic brokerage of ethnic e-labor migration in China. Lately, she's conducting two projects on international labor migration and the refugee. One is about the migration pattern of undocumented do domestic migrant workers from Southeast Asia to China. Uh, and another one is on the resettled Vietnamese refugees in China. Uh, Xin Rong's publica publication is, uh, uh, has appeared in a few different journals. And this, uh, this publication is centered on the theme of ethnic minority labor migration and citizenship. Um, she is the author of Entrapment by Consent, the co-ethnic brokerage system among ethnic e-labor migrants in China. Uh, this is her doctoral thesis and is publicly um, accessible. Uh, I think I will not say too much about myself. I mentioned I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Oslo and my research focus actually is on uh, gender and politics in contemporary China. So I want to say that our seminar will be lasting uh, about 19 minutes, since now it's uh, 3.05 in Central European time, uh, 9 p.m. in Beijing time, and uh, 9 a.m. in the American Eastern time. So we're, we're trying not to go over time. So the uh, structure will be as follow, that Julia will talk about 15 to 20 minutes first, 
and Xin Rong will um, be continuing her presentation about also 15 to 20 minutes. Then uh, we'll be having a Q&A that lasts about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, including both questions prepared by me and also questions that we draw from the audience. So if you do have questions that you want to ask those authors, you can write in the um, Q&A function on Zoom. Great. Um, that's all, Julia. The floor is yours. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I should say I'm really excited to be here foremost because I feel you know labor brokerage is such an important um, kind of window to look on to, you know, for viewing the Chinese economy at large. And, you know, um, Union mentioned my book, Beneath the China Boom, uh, which just came out last year. And that really focuses on kind of labor brokerage as a, as a method for understanding the linkages between China's rural and China's urban economy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, I'll give you small snippets from that book, I think. Um, okay. So, I mean, my book was sort of written, um, I did the research a long time ago, actually, from 2007 to 2012. And during those five years, I spent about 31 months, like two continuous years following migrant workers employed in China's construction industry. And of course, China's construction industry is renowned for several reasons. One is its scope and scale. I mean, China's embarked on the largest, um, most rapid uh, urbanization in world history in recent years since around the mid 2000s until now. Um, and what I did during this period was I, um, I started off doing an ethnography of China, construction workers in Beijing. And then I followed these construction workers from Beijing to two villages in Sichuan province. And each village, I would then rent a bedroom in a migrant household. And then there I would observe how village labor in each of these villages was being constantly recruited. So each village, for example, would have a broker. He was an entrepreneurial village man who would deliver village labor to um, subcontractors in the construction industry in cities. And so I studied this process of labor recruitment because I really found that it was, um, again, as I mentioned before, a, a process that really centrally links urban and rural economies in a way that has really long lasting transfer of uh, implications for the macro economy. And it, it ultimately reveals a lot of transformations um, within China's you know, overall economy, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, so here are the two villages. One was sort of in Lushan, near Lushan city in um, Southern Sichuan. The other one was a, a sort of satellite village on Chongqing, which has now been urbanized. And that region is now considered part of the uh, district, a district of Chongqing. So I'll, I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, the construction kind of industry is quite interesting, I think, because it really has these peculiarities in how it implements or how it utilizes labor. So construction um, is actually, um, banned from using, construction enterprises are banned from using um, state um, state bank funds from borrowing from state banks by and large. I mean, some state-owned construction enterprises are able to borrow, um, but this is a limitation that's, this is a regulation that's in, implemented because um, the central government wants to sort of um, um, not encourage overheating um, urbanization, which has happened nevertheless. But as a result of, construction enterprises not being able to borrow from state banks, they've actually turned toward this kind of debt-fueled labor recruitment instead. And so what this means is that, you know, there's a huge informal subcontracting chain through which contractors, construction enterprises sort of um, utilize labor. First, you know, property developers initiate projects and they get the land deeds and, um, secure rights and then they can contract a construction enterprise. That construction enterprise then calls on informal labor subcontractors. Usually these are urban men um, who have wide ranging contacts among rural labor brokers who then contact their labor rural brokers and these labor brokers um, then go back to their home villages where they recruit men and some women to work on these construction sites. Um, because uh, capital because many of the projects are not capitalized, um, 
by state banks, this means that property developers only pay at the, the very end of each year. And at the very end of each year, in around January, right before Spring Festival, wage payments trickle down. At each level, the person takes a cut and pans down what's left next. And so, of course, village laborers are not able to get paid for the, their year of of, of, of labor until the very end. And so in order to survive that year of sort of what's in essentially indentured servitude, um, they borrow number one cash from brokers. So brokers have to have enough capital to lend them monthly payments. And then they also um, have their families back in the countryside farming land by and large in order to survive until they can um, until they can secure wage payment. So this is a way in which uh, this whole labor kind of recruitment structure actually really um, it relies on the interdependence between rural subsistence economy in the Chinese countryside and then urbanization in, uh, in cities. So urbanization really relies on the, the fact that families of workers are able to farm land in order to provide kind of a wage subsidy um, while they await delayed wage payment. So I'll tell you about what this looks like, I guess. Um, so this is, a, this is a banquet in Faming Village. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was um, primarily women living in this village year round. They're, the women would farm the land while their husbands would work construction. And the second thing to note about this photograph actually is that men's remittances are being used to, to build two-story houses like the one here. And to do this, the women are running this low interest money lending scheme. So this scene is the aftermath of a banquet. The house belongs to the woman in the middle and she held the banquet to thank the women flanking her for lending their husband's remittances to help her build the house. So while the women are farming and lending money in Fa Ming, their husbands are being recruited into construction work. So here's a group of men discussing um, the next year's migration. The man on the far right is a man named Boscow. Bosco is the unofficial labor broker of Farming Village. He has a difficult job. So throughout the year, he has to give each worker around, at the time was 50 US dollars a month, all out of pocket. However, at the end of many years, subcontractors often would abscond without paying either him or his workers. So the only way for Bosco to prevent this was to become a long-term monopolistic labor supplier. In other words, some contractors would reliably pay him if they knew that the next year's labor delivery, delivery depended on it. And so Bosco has to keep his labor supply coming. He has to retain workers, he has to keep them disciplined, even while he's actively suppressing their wages. And he does this by enlisting other villagers, for, for example, his wife, his family members, to then put pressure on young wayward migrants not to work for other outside brokers. So again, this is how labor in cities is really embedded in village economies. Not only is migrant labor in China really embedded with farming, but or interdependent with farming, but also labor in cities is actively being disciplined through village relationships. So let me give you an example of this. Um, in 2010, Boscow had problems with a 24 year old man named Little Fatty. He's married, but he has somewhat of a wayward tendency. This is little fatty here. Sometimes he would abscond from the construction site to meet up with his middle school classmates. They would spend a week smoking and gaming in internet cafes. So Bosco asked his wife, Madame Gao, to befriend little fatty's wife back in the village. This is little fatty's wife, Sister He. She met little fatty when the two worked briefly in a factory in South China. Her own natal village was comparatively wealthy, a coastal village in a coastal province. And rumor had it that she was tricked, hoodwinked into marrying little fatty, who had wooed her with apocryphal stories about a supposedly wealthy factory owning father back in the village. Sister Hu's dissatisfaction with the impoverished life that little fatty had actually given her made her especially vulnerable to the influence of Madame Gao. So when the trouble started, uh, Boss Gao asked his wife, Madame Gao, to buy little sister or sister he a cell phone so that she could better keep track of little fatty. Previously, she had no way of contacting him. And then Madame Gao insinuated herself further into sister He's trust. She taught her how to buy pigs, piglets at the market in order to 
raise to adulthood and then sell for petty income. She taught her how to farm. And once in a while, Madame Gao would make an idle remark about little fatty, about how he didn't seem to be sending many money home lately. Madame Gao pointed out that Sister Hu's house was falling apart while other migrants were building new houses for their wives. And she even gave Sister Hu money for household repairs. Eventually, she advised Sister Hu not to be satisfied with an oath of a husband. She told her, today women can make demands. She said, you may not know this, but in this village, a man can build a one-story house for around 5,000 US dollars. That's just three years of saved wages. A woman could tell her husband that you must build me a house, for example. She might say, you build me a house or I will go back to my natal home. So this was part of Madame Gao's strategy. She was um, hoping that Sister Hu would eventually domesticate her husband. And I should add that this ploy produced a suboptimal outcome for Boss Gao. Rather than domesticating Little Fatty, it ended up leading to the couple's eventual divorce. So the failure of this marriage notwithstanding, marriages in farming village were frequently formally arranged, um, sometimes by you know, uh, elderly women who served as matchmakers to match high earning migrants with women from impoverished families, other times to match footloose migrants like Little Fatty to women with a proclivity for farming, although these women were increasingly difficult to find. So this is how the labor sort of market remains embedded in the land-based rural economy. Again, women are farming in order to protect their husbands from wage arrears. And in addition, Boscow is leveraging trust and reciprocity between village women in order to discipline migrants in cities. So I'm gonna take you to another village um, um, about 500 kilometers away. This is Landing Village. Um, so if life in Fahmin village in, revealed this interdependence between labor migration and the agrarian economy, which has fueled, of course, China's you know, stratospheric organization, it's, it's fueled, it's the same interdependence that's also fueled at China's manufacturing export boom. Um, then, then now, you know, in Landing Village, 500 kilometers away, the countryside is actively changing. And I would say this Landing Village reflects more the reality of, of Chinese villages today. So I went to Landing Village during my field work for one reason. Um, in Fami, I had been hearing rumors about a man named Bospo. This is Bospo here. I had heard that he was the unofficial labor broker of Landing Village. And I heard that in the past, he often visited farming and he regularly hired farming laborers away from Boscow. So when I found these villagers and I asked them about Boss Bo, they often told me conflicting stories. Many men admired Boss Bo, a self-made man who left home when he was 15. Others reported that he once withheld wages from farming workers um, and held them essentially in debt peonage. This was a narrative that Boss Bo himself corroborated, but framed instead as a case of discipline. He could not pay men, he said, who had not delivered level labor at the level that he expected. So in 2011, I went to Landing Village and I met Boss Bo, who agreed to rent me a room in his house for a year. So I rarely saw Boss Bo during the year that although I was living in his own host household for that year, he was always traveling. Whereas Boss Gao had only recruited farming labor, Boss Bo had expanded his labor brokerage business to several villages. And so here are the kind of neighboring villages that he was recruiting labor from. He did this by re forging relationships with laborers from other villages and then asking them to serve as middlemen. And these middlemen would then recruit labor from their home villages on his behalf to work for his subcontractors and cities. So he had very specific reasons for selecting each of these villages. He selected Faming, for example, because his brother-in-law had married a woman there. And he thought that this brother-in-law would then be able to leverage his wife's kin relationships to help him discipline labor. So during my time in, Fa in, in Landing Village, I was continually wondering, why is he continuing to broker labor in so many places? His profits were not actually increasing, he once told me. Expansion was costly. He was lending thousands of dollars to workers across villages. Sometimes his middlemen could not keep workers under control. And now he had to also maintain good relationships with many, many more subcontractors in many cities. So later I discovered the reason for Bospo's business strategy. He was expanding his brokerage, not for profits, but instead to maintain simply a stable labor force. In Landing Village, and this is where it is in relation to Chongqing City, all village land at the time was being expropriated by the government. And 
And Boswell had discovered that landless laborers were also agreed laborers. So early in the year, some landing villagers in his employ had requested time off to come home. For example, one of them had said rumors were circulating that village houses were being demolished. Others asked him if they could get their wages for the whole year in advance. So of course, this is part of China's urbanization, I guess, this wave of land expropriations that crept up on landing villagers during the time that I lived there. Um, so this is all kind of, at the time, a result of the new socialist countryside campaign, which has now been modernized into the new style urbanization plan. And it allows local governments to expropriate land, rural land from households in order to um, develop that rural land for urban real estate or agribusiness development. And then it takes the people who used to live on that rural land and then moves them into high rise apartments um, and then issues them urban hukou, although that urban hukou is still pinned to these townships that are being built right on top of village land. So they still don't have the equivalent of urban hukou. They're still tied to the place of birth. So this is kind of a heuristic drawing of the, the village, the new or township plan for the village that I was staying in. So of course, you know, what did these plans mean for villagers? Well, for Boss Bo, this urbanization presented an investment opportunity. So he purchased an apartment in a nearby county seat for over a hundred um, K US dollars at the time. And he was anticipating um, rapid appreciation. He was preparing to upgrade his family from rural Huko to urban residents. Back in the village, however, a great many mealtime conversations like the one pictured here were centered around the issue of welfare. When villagers relinquished their land and converted their rural hukou to urban citizenship, most of them hoped to qualify for welfare, and this would help them cover their expenses while they waited year-end wages. Um, however, that year, um, this program, the DBA program, was being rolled back, and villagers were suddenly being urged to rely on their family instead, and this created great um, consternation among villagers. So, okay, how did these village sort of transformations, how do these, how does this forced relocation and this welfare reduction affect labor supply? Well, villagers in Landing then had to um, sort of work under the same conditions as before with delayed wage payment, but they had no land and no welfare to sort of support them in the meantime. So there were sort of three strategies that, um, that workers implemented. Some tried to move in with their families, Others um, tried to turn to entrepreneurship instead of long distance labor migration. And still others continue working long distance labor migration, but often um, ending up in debt um, as a result. So I wanna kind of pause here and sort of um, talk a little bit about um, what this reveals about China's macro economy, I guess. Um, and how labor brokerage is important for understanding this. And I'll, I'll keep my, my comments here very short. Um, so, you know, China's low cost labor, it, it really is sort of a result of two things, right? One is that welfare is localized. So public goods are only available in place of origin. And this is in, in, enforced through the household uh, registration, the hukou system. And two, uh, low, low cost labor is kind of a result of fiscal decentralization, meaning that rural governments are responsible for uh, funding public goods for a public population that is employed mainly in cities. So this has led to this huge sort of rural urban um, gap by which, you know, because of labor migration or through labor migration, um, here's been a huge transfer of resources from the urban, from the rural economy to the urban economy. So my argument is simply that, um, you know, this has led to huge fiscal burdens for local governments, primarily rural local governments. And here you can kind of see that um, revenues have really um, been outpaced by expenditures since privatization in 1994. And this gap is currently growing. And this is kind of what's driving urbanization is local governments trying to make up that revenues gap by monetizing land. And so essentially what I want to argue is that this, this sort of, um, this whole cycle leads to this, um, this kind of self-defeating or self-cannibalizing model of development in China, whereby wage suppression, which really supported export production, led to rural deficits. And this led to urban expansion and rural land sales. And finally, these rural land sales are now decimating this sort of um, household land rights and rural agrarian economy on which wage suppression really was predicated. 
So this is a sort of central argument of my book, which, which is simply that this model of development based on wage, low wage um, labor, or the suppression of wages in China um, is being eroded by these, um, by these rural land sales. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is um, really wonderful. And I look forward to all of the questions. Thank you so much, Julia. This is fascinating and uh, gives so much to, uh, to digest. Uh, but now let's move on to Xinrong's talk. Uh, thanks, Heidi's invitation also. I think Julia really gave me a very good in introduction for my presentation as well, because I'm focused on a group of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, labor migration. And uh, yeah, it's a, a story about ethnic Yi, uh, migrant workers in cities. Um, to start this presentation, I'm going to talk firstly about one of my personal story. Uh, in the summer of 2011, I was a volunteer teacher in Liangshan Yi Autonomous Area, one of the poorest regions in China. In my class, I asked the students the question, what are you going to do uh, after your primary school? Now, they told me loudly, we are going to Dagong, which means to become a migrant worker in the big cities. Actually, I was very astonished um, by the answers. Later, my concern for the future lives as migrant worker in city opened up my late uh, PhD journey to look at the migration, the employment, and the struggle of this group of uh, minority workers in cities. Um, yeah, in 2006, uh, 2013, I started my fieldwork in Dongguan, the so-called factory of the world. During seven months fieldwork, I interviewed e-workers and brokers in some of the, some of the labor agencies. Um, later, I followed a group of workers to enter an electronic factory. I live with e female workers in the dormitory and where I was able to conduct interview and participant observations. After then, I follow some of them to their hometown to celebrate their new year and stay there for a month. Actually, after I finished my PhD study, the main field work, I returned to Dongguan and Liangshan three times to trace their changes afterwards. Um, my informants are generally um, young, young migrants. Um, they are 16 to 25 years old e-workers. I also, of course, uh, interviewed laborers and government officers. Um, but today I'm going to focus on e-female migrant workers and to explore how migration shapes their gendered experience and how it matters with the co uh, brokerage system. Well, I just gave a very brief introduction of the existing literature. There has been quite some study on China's migration as Julia just now talked about. So yeah, we know some study focus on citizenship uh, related to Hukou and other such as um, Chen Kuan Li and Tan Yi has documented how women migrants are exploited and controlled in the capitalist production. Um, feminist scholars argue that women are more likely to be pushed into precarious work because they have to shoulder both production and social reproduction responsibilities. Um, in this study, I think just as many of the feminist scholar has argued, um, gender is not the only factor, neither class. So they oftentimes interact with each other to produce social inequality. I will show how the intersectionality of class, gender, and ethnicity shapes workers' migration experience through the co-ethnic brokerage system. Well, as I mentioned before, ethnic uh, autonomous area is one of the most impoverished areas in China. So out migration 
it's very much driven by the desire of changing the economic poverty. However, in my interview, I found people oftentimes talk about the marriage in the traditional society. Like this is uh, one of the workmates in, in the factory. Um, she told me, my parents fixed the date for me to marry a distant cousin. I don't have any affection for him. I es escaped to Xichang, but my dad called me and said, why not to come back to marry the guy? My mom would rather drink potion and kill herself. I spent my wedding days in tears. I was once a good student, but my interest in study soon straight. When well, a group, a group of people in my village decided to leave, I escaped with them. Actually, um, this is not a very good story, but it turns out to be a very common story in my interview with Liang Shan Yi woman. This matter greatly with the traditional um, marriage system in Liang Shan. Ethnic people are usually uh, engaged at birth or just in their very young age, and their marriage are usually carried out when people are roughly uh, yeah, teenagers. This traditional marriage system is greatly related to the idea of preserving the purity of their blood as ethnic Yi. So the Asian Yi people hardly intermarry with other ethnic Yi groups. Black Yi people, the upper class, are usually not allowed to marry white Yi, the lower class. Mm, I find the young, um, young people see the out migration somehow as a way to fight against such a long existing marriage system. Well, married, many of them, especially females, have been inspired by what they saw as a free marriage in the Han area after returning to their hometown, they made a request to their parents to call off the marriage contract. Just like I showed, um, Xiao Li said, I would have to earn money because my family should pay the groom family at the bride fee. Uh, the price should be at its current market value so they can, uh, he can marry a bride. Well, Perhaps we couldn't really imagine how it comes because uh, villagers, um, their incomes in Liangshan area is very low. Usually it's just a few thousand RMB, but the bright value, a uh, bright fee in, in Liangshan actually uh, ranged yeah, to average 300,000 RMB. So many people, if they want to divorce, uh, they want to end their contract of marriage, they have to pay back uh, the bride fee that the husband has married them before. So not only female, but also males have suffered a lot from such kind of a uh, bride fee and they um, have to go out to work to earn enough money in order to marry. Yeah, so many of them didn't go to work individually. They follow a co-ethnic broker to work in city. This is um, firstly because um, many of the Yi workers have low literacy. So they are very disadvantaged in the labor market. Um, but also a lot of them because of their minority status was um, they, they, they were stigmatized as backward and barbaric minority or troublemakers. That excludes them from the uh, normal job market. So co-ethnic brokerage functions in such a condition. Yeah, like Julia said, they also recruit people from their hometown to the labor market, they arrange buses to uh, for the, the ethnic Yi member to arrive at the labor agencies. Afterwards, uh, the labor agencies and the 
uh, e-brokers, dispatch workers to factories. Uh, sometimes they have to pay a price, price fake ID for these underage workers. Mm, it seems it functions similar with other kind of a co uh, uh, migration brokerage, right? But as ethnic key members, they are expected to offer help and protection because of their ethnic identity. So I just show um, a case that Aimo, a factory girl, experienced um, yeah, in, in 2000, uh, 2014. So Aimo worked in an electronic factory. Um, she had a very serious injury incident in a local hospital which cost her a three months salary. The hospital refused to pay her injury compensation, but her brokers and a, another group of females organized a collective action, which helped her to demand compensation back. They were eventually paid money. Aimo got her proportion and the rest went into the pocket of the group of female, uh, male brokers. This Aimo told me, we often meet difficulties in the city. We may have to work in factory for a few months without receiving any payment. Some of people do not know how to communicate with hand people, but all this problem would be solved if we have a broker. Um, broker also um, function um, as some, um, you know, provider of ethnic reciprocity. So this is uh, happen very often. Ethnic um, um, broker will lend money to workers family and also give workers wage to their parents rather than to the workers themselves. So they can earn trust from the elders from the family, uh, even though they may treat workers badly in the city. So Xiaoyang is the one who wears a red shirt. Um, he is very capable and very smart. He can do a job on his, himself, but he didn't. He said, the broker is an uncle from my clan. My dad said, we'd better not to leave because he had done us a favor. Uh, without him, we couldn't have been able to find jobs. So we should let him earn the money. Well, if the ethnic membership and ethnic reciprocity has functions to control both male and female, the social hierarchy and unequal gender relationship put worker in a more vulnerable status. Broker, we can see are overwhelmingly dominated by men. So sometimes I observe that uh, some male worker invited female worker to serve alcohol in bars. Those kind of invitation are against the moral um, tradition in e-society, but very few female would, uh, would dare to openly define broker's authority. Some e female worker engage in long-term or short-term sexual relationship, becoming mysteries of these uh, brokers. Um, it's perhaps difficult to say whether they choose to do choose or they have to do so because um, there are very few avenues for them if they really want to move out of the factory, out of the workers' dormitory to receive another diff kind, a diff, uh, different life. Some e female worker went to work in entertainment fact, uh, sector after years of working in factories. Xiaowei, She's one of my best workmates in the factory. She worked in a bar serving alcohol. She told me, sister, my work is legal. You know, my parents are not against me doing this work. Oh, yeah. The job is a lot easier and far quicker to make money than working in factory. You know, it requires good communication skills with males. And you have to look pretty to get this job. Very few e girls are suited to do this work. I know um, in our con conversation, she was a bit afraid that I would judge her according to what he, 
she do? Uh, what she she what kind of job she do? So um, because these jobs are regarded dishonored and might bring shame back to the hometown. Actually, um, SNE are very conservative in terms of sex and marriage. However, they have long been sexualized from the perspective of Han. Working with co-ethnic brokers in city didn't bring anything good for this group of women, but also, uh, but only underpin, uh, underpin the sexualized stereotypes among Han Chinese. I'm going to the conclusion. Oh, I use the title Run Away, Run Away Nora um, in this presentation. I'm sure many of the audience are very familiar with this story. Actually, women in general are subjected to very vulnerable social and em employment structure, although the foundation of the uh, patriarchy varies among different social contexts. So my creation has been dramatically changing the gender structure. I find that increased uh, mobility and interaction with outside world has given young women new gender perception and empowered them. However, the co-ethnic brokerage I just now present um, really uh, replaced another form of patriarchy and gender inequality. That's the story I'm going to present today. Thank you for the listening. Yeah, thank you both uh, of you, Julia and uh, Xinrong. Um, I have to say that your, both of your presentations are full of such fascinating and detailed field work stories that you have experienced like personally. So we can feel the very kind of raw and uh, intu intuitional kind of materials you brought back from the field work. And I think um, both what I have learned uh, about your field work is definitely exemplary, not only in the field of labor and migration studies, but also in general for any researchers who are doing field work in China. It's, um, it's really, both of your work are very well written and very rich uh, in terms of ethnographic uh, details. I will just start with Julia's work. I'm going to just say a few things that what I learned uh, about your research through your book. And I'm going to ask you maybe just one or two questions. Uh, and perhaps after Julia's response, then I move to Xin Rong. Uh, and I can ask Xin Rong one or two questions. And at the end, we can move to audience questions. Is that all right for both of you? Okay, great. So Julia, I have to say your book, it's such an enjoyable read. Uh, I think it's, it's, so, it's so impressive that you are capable um, to actually link uh, very um, kind of everyday uh, storytelling of what you have seen in your field work, including all the different characters you also mentioned a bit in your presentation. You're able to link those uh, individual stories to such grand uh, transformation that China is undergoing, namely in terms of both political economy and industri industrial uh, transformation, or, or what you have been mentioning as the grand development strategy of China. So I find that very, very impressive. And of course, your book is much broader and uh, it goes towards many different um, aspects of um, um, rural urban development and also migrant work, work, uh, workers' lives. Uh, today's talk, you focused, you used rather um, kind of individual cases to illustrate how labor brokerage works uh, kind of between rural China and urban China and how that affects individuals. Um, I guess in your book, you do use, uh, you do define labor brokerage in the sense that you emphasize it is both the commodification of the land and the labor that actually um, kind of uh, forms this sense of um, um, kind of extracting uh, human resources and land resources into the market system. And in this process, 
labor blockage played uh, such a uh, significant role. Uh, you also used some graphic kind of illustration today to kind of give us a, uh, a very quick um, explanation of that. So I'd like to maybe invite you to elaborate a little bit more on um, the role of uh, rural labor brokers, especially in the sense that you did mention in your book that you think there's a new class of rural labor brokers that are kind of ongoing uh, or uh, is in the process of forming um, kind of its distinct social uh, status or social positioning. Um, you also mentioned in your presentation, Boss Gao was able to kind of um, consolidate his status as a broker, also brought in enough capital to build uh, or to renovate his apartment or build new um, houses in a way that rural labor brokers seem to be benefiting quite a lot in such a brokerage system. So I guess my question would be, how did they achieve so? Uh, it seems that the, these uh, labor brokers in the countryside are also either um, fellow villagers of the migrant workers or even clan or family members of those workers. It seems they're not um, at the origin so distinguishable, but it seems there are certain people who stand out in this labor brokerage system and they do manage to become the ones who are leading the fellow villagers to become workers and they benefit more from this. I guess I wonder how does this kind of class formation process, um, how is it unfolding, at least in your field work? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is um, that I guess I want to invite you to say a few more words about um, gender and uh, um, migration in order to kind of respond a bit to Xin Rong's talk as well. Because in your book, you did mention that women's part, especially their uh, responsibility in terms of subsistence farming and also providing kind of the necessity for the seasonal construction workers to sustain themselves is a very important part to keep this uh, loop going. And you also did mention that the agriculture in China is going through this feminization process that women are in charge of farming, women, uh, men are more uh, going out, so looking for migrant working um, kind of wages. So I guess, um, can you tell us a bit more whether you find gender as also a very kind of fundamental aspect in your main argument, namely kind of the double, the dual uh, track of land and labor, um, uh, how to say, commodification? if that makes sense, yeah. Thank sure, you. yeah, those are great questions. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Yeah, rural labor brokers are really sort of the, the middlemen um, upon which the commodification of labor across the China economy works. And of course, I just looked at the construction industry and that's not because construction is the most generalizable industry. It's not because it employs the most people in rural China, it certainly does not. But I looked at it because it, because it has this delayed wage payment system, it, it most extremely and most intensely sort of um, requires the interdependence of rural economy and urban economy. And so these labor brokers are really pivotal um, in sort of enabling this kind of ongoing transfer of, of labor as a resource from rural economy to urban economy. So you asked, you know, who are these, well, I, I guess you mentioned this dual, in the book I have this, dual model of development in China. And I argue that Chinese, the Chinese economy really today relies on two very contradictory models of capital accumulation. <coughs> the first occurs, <coughs> excuse me, through the commodification of labor, through these labor, rural labor brokers. <coughs> and then the second occurs through kind of the commodification of rural land through urbanization. And that process I didn't talk as so much about, but I argue that both, both, these, both of these things are contradictory in the sense that the commodification of land undermines the conditions necessary for the commodification of labor, namely that it, it gets rid of that rural subsistence economy um, that's required for industries like construction to continue um, paying workers on a delayed wage payment schedule. 
So then you ask this question, you know, who are these rural labor brokers? How do they get to be such? And that's a really interesting question. Um, the people that I met who are labor brokers usually had a significant source of starting capital because it does, it's a risky job that requires a lot of upfront capital investment. Um, not only because these work, these brokers have to give um, sort of allowance money to sustain their workers while they're living in cities, but also because they have to sort of survive multiple years of arrears when construction subcontractors just don't pay them anything. And they still have to give out that 50 US dollars. I apologize, I put everything in US currency because I usually give this talk to US audiences, but this is a global audience, I should have left it in Chinese yen. Um, but but yeah, so so they still have to keep up that allowance payment even when they don't get paid by subcontractors. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of Boscao, for example, he was the labor broker who only recruited from one bombing village. Um, his father was had a uh, herbal medicine um, small business during the six during the eighties. Um, and this later provided the starting capital for him and, and his brother to become labor brokers. They were very small time labor brokers in the grand scope of things. So mm. um, Baspo had a very different story in Lending Village because of its proximity to Chongqing, because of its high levels of rural urban integration. Um, number one, migration started a lot earlier. Mm. Um, that was also partly driven by the fact that the agrarian economy there was not strong. The land was quite unarable and rocky and mountainous. And so unlike farming village where you had this really kind of vibrant farming village was built on riverine land, just, uh, just abutting um, uh, the Minjiang River. So it was really fertile land. It, it created a large incentive for people to build houses in the village with their remittances. On the other hand, in Landing, number one, migration started a lot earlier. It started in the 1980s, whereas in Fami, it only started in the 1990s. Um, and it, in Fami, it really only started because Boss Bo started going there, actually. He was the one that sort of initiated the migra migration from that village. And in Landing, so people started migrating earlier in much more desperate straits. And then you saw this kind of class of labor brokers who were just enterprising people um, being, being able to sort of accumulate capital through kind of mutual exploitation of their co-villagers um, through brokering their labor. And then that class of people then um, reinvested a lot of their profits into entrepreneurial activity. So in fact, the most desired career path in Landing Village um, was not to become a labor broker period. It was to become a labor broker, but then later take your earnings and start a small restaurant or a small auto shop or a small repair shop on the margins of Chongqing city. And so many people had done so. There was a, a small migrant village within Chongqing that was populated by a lot of these entrepreneurs who had made a lot of money during the 1980s from Landing Village, um, who then bought apartments in Chongqing or on the edge of Chongqing and then established small businesses there. So that was the really desired career path among landing villagers. So you're right that this is a new kind of class of rural elites. Um, they're also the ones who organize a lot of these labor flows across and between cities and villages. Um, and yeah, I thought, I, I thought they were quite fascinating. Uh, of course, this is still specific to construction. So in manufacturing labor, for example, you don't see this class of brokers because um, to get a job in a factory, um, as Sin Rong mentioned, you know, a, a lot of these jobs, you just go and take a test at the factory gates. You go to the factory gates on a certain day, you line up, you take a test and then you're in. So it's quite different in construction. Um, you asked about gender. I'll talk about that a little briefly so we have more time. I don't wanna take up all the time. Not sure. Okay, so this gender question is interesting because I, you know, I really found this very traditional patriarchal um, division of labor, uh, whereby agricultural was feminized and migrant labor was masculinized in farming village. But I think that was very specific to the political economy of that village. That village was entirely dependent on migrant remittances in construction. And in construction, wages are much higher than in manufacturing. So there was a lot of um, impetus for households to try to send one male into construction rather than you know two people into manufacturing. So that was sort of the, the reason for the, the preservation of this very sort of strict patriarchal uh, division of labor. In Landing Village, um, again, like I feel like that gendered social structure had broken down 
because of the very different uh, political economy there. There were a lot of women entrepreneurs. They were women who were kin, like um, close relatives of labor brokers who had received some seed capital from labor brokers and then went on to become on women entrepreneurs in Chongqing City. So there was a it was a much sort of more, much more broad idea of what a woman could do uh, to make a livelihood in Landing than there was in farming. Um, and again, you know, Landing Village, because it was number one, undergoing urbanization, and number two, because before, even before urbanization, long before, agriculture had been so unprofitable there, um, nobody reinvested money back in the village. Nobody was building these two-story two homes back in the village. They all took their money and they put it into um, trying to develop a stake in the nearby cities or county seats. And so that led to a very different relationship um, between agriculture and, 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 and labor migration. It also led to a very different kind of picture of what gender relations look like. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, that's just my uh, somewhat yeah. reductionist, but explanation for why these two gender structures look yeah. very different. Yeah, and that all comes down to the fact that you made such an excellent choice of the two case studies, and they are quite similar, but yet so different in a very significant way. And it's very, very useful for um, generating arguments. And I guess that's how why you chose them. You mentioned that you were doing um, theoretically oriented case selection. I think it's brilliant. Great, thank you so much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> if you do have questions for Xin Rong, you can also uh, maybe later after or during one okay. drawing question from audience, you can also raise some questions. So Xin Rong, um, I read your doctorate thesis uh, and of course today's uh, talk is kind of related to the general kind of doctoral research you've done. Uh, and I have to say that both Julie and you have maybe coincidentally uh, chosen a similar kind of um, southwestern region of China to study labor and migration. It's interesting, but your research does add on to this new dimension of ethnicity. And specifically today, I think uh, your talk on e-migrant women workers and their experience of moving to cities through the labor brokers and their experience in the factories, I think is simply so important as um, it's a matter of fact that we do not have enough research on the intersectionality of class, gender, and uh, ethnicity in China. So that's also why I think your research is definitely a very, very valuable contrib contribution to the field. Um, and uh, um, coming back to your um, presentation today, I think um, what you have studied about e-migrant workers is definitely a, uh, a great kind of, um, you, you joined a very important uh, academic dialogue started or kind of um, promoted by scholars like uh, Peng Nai and Ye Yunxiang and other um, scholars who just started to, to kind of um, research more, to study more about female um, migrant workers. Um, I guess to start my first question, uh, it's slightly related to what I asked uh, to Julia. It's still focusing on the labor brokers. Um, you mentioned that you think those e-migrant work, uh, female workers remind you of Nora, of the famous kind of uh, figure of when a woman leaves the patriarchal home, what happens to her? And I guess your um, observation of their stories kind of resembles a bit to uh, kind of to the debate that when a woman leaves a patriarchal home, it doesn't mean she will definitely break free from all for forms of oppression. And you did elaborate in your research that those e-migrant women workers do enter another kind of uh, different rounds of oppression and exploitation. Um, and here you did mention some stories about how uh, young e women being um, objectified and being somehow treated differently because of their gender um, by their co-ethnic brokers. So here, I guess, audience also has the question that these brokers are also their fellow villagers. 
and they might also be their cousins or relatives or their uh, kind of senior members of the family, or many of them also know those girls quite well. Uh, a kind of intuitional guess would be they should be acting as the protectors or kind of the, the guardian or the patrons of those um, women uh, workers instead of actually exploiting them or sexualizing them in such a way. Uh, I guess that will lead us to a question, so why did that happen and how come these e-girls, e-women did not have any um, instruments or means to negotiate or resist such uh, exploitation um, from coming from their um, co-ethnic kind of relatives or um, members of their community who are also brokers at the same time. So I guess it really questions um, how did these brokers kind of um, start to use their uh, gender as a kind of um, dominant, dominating um, factor? And did the Yi women have any kind of forms of resistance? That's the first question. And the second question, I think I'm fascinated by um, that the fact you focus quite a lot on both the structural um, disadvantages um, of these e women workers, but you do also mention uh, empowerment and agency. And in your doctor research, uh, although you didn't mention that much today, you did have chapters that elaborate on the so-called um, everyday resistance, or um, it's, it's I guess the sort sort of like the uh, the power of the the weak, or I mean the um, the weapon of the weak. Um, I guess whether if we, if I'm allowed, if we have time, you can maybe share a bit more on your observations of those e women and their resistance in the factories, especially when they are encountering difficulties and disputes, whether they are able to actually form alliances with each other in order to resist both the oppression coming from kind of the capitalists, the bosses, but also from other uh, dominant uh, ethnic groups or um, um, maybe even coming from their own co-ethnic brokers. So that's the two questions I have. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Yu. Um, it's really good to have this question. Um, yeah, for the first question, actually, um, I think there has been um, a very dramatic transformation among the group of ethnic e workers in the past uh, 20 years. In the beginning, mostly are the you know, clan members, the, their relatives from the same village who bring the worker out. Lately, you will see that uh, some of the broker established uh, labor agencies and some of the small broker actually don't have the power to establish a labor agency. They would just uh, send the workers to the labor agency who, you know, uh, the, the big broker has established. So it seems um, in the second um, decade, I, I, I think the relationship between broker and worker changed. It's much more commercialized because the director, uh, you know, the big boss are usually not their clan members or relatives. So the presentation, um, I, I, I talk about, you know, the sexualized relationship is usually not from the, uh, the broker from the village, but from the others who they actually didn't know in the village. Um, that's why, yeah, the sexualized relationship has becoming much more significant in the later decades. Um, yeah, the second question about, um, yeah, why do they have any kind of a resistance? Mm, well, actually, this is also one of my questions I want to examine in the factory because I work in the factory and live with the, um, uh, the workers in the same dormitory. I act because uh, in the beginning, I uh, just assume that migrant workers, especially E, you know, they have strong solidarity. They can organize together, both 
men and women to fight against the oppression, oppression or exploitation from the managers. Uh, eventually, I found only males organize the collective actions, like they can organize protests, strikes, or just um, stop to work, um, even fight on the street um, to give pressure to the managers and also to the government. But males, they usually don't do that. Unfortunately, they also have a lot of struggles. What they do, just like you summarized, everyday form of, of resistance, you know, they, they may just uh, per pretend to be sick or mm -hmm. flow in their production line mm -hmm. or just absent from their job. But eventually they will be convinced by either their brokers or, you know, the factory managers. I think because a uh, woman initially, they were trained to be submissive in the patriarchal society. The power of resistance is, I think they have the power, but really people don't have the courage and don't have the kind of a organizational uh, power to, to fight. Because, uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, I think for men, you know, fighting is a way to show their masculinity then that's a good thing in the society, but it's not good for women to be more obedient um, and all more submissive. Um, that's good uh, quality, a good, yeah, good character from many of them. So I think the agency of them are mostly expressed uh, through, you know, um, fight against the uh, arranged marriage. Mm. That's the thing for them mm. currently. Mm. Um, yeah, but lately I, I went to the uh, Liangshan Yi village where I live um, during my field, uh, my PT field work. I found a lot of them actually um, now they are more older and they start to have children and they ask their children, they don't want to uh, engage their children according to the you know traditional uh, uh, as the e culture, so I think for the next generation, most of them won't has have such a great problem to struggle with. Yeah, yeah this is very moving. I guess very um, pertinent to the study of how gender intersects with um, ethnicity. I mean, um, it makes sense that even though those Yi women wanted to be part of the modern world which was part of their reason to leave their own hometown. But still, even when they find themselves outside of the hometown in the, working in the factory, um, it's hard to break free from all different elements that could be considered as something that they want to leave. Uh, I guess, it, yeah, as you mentioned that um, it's, it's a long process and uh, um, the idea of modernity, the idea of what women should be like, uh, what a, kind of a, a strong modern woman should be like. It's a long also kind of process of practicing and learning. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, those are very insightful answers. We have quite a lot of questions coming from the audience. We have 20 minutes to um, address some of them. If we can't address, I think we won't be able, be able to address all of them. I will, we will send uh, all of them to you after the seminar as well. So uh, I have the first question for Julia. Um, this is uh, from Yunpeng Zhang from, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, from Kian Fan Lim uh, at Newcastle University in UK. Uh, the question for Julia is, uh, you've presented fascinating case studies. I have a question on the logic presented at the end of your presentation. How does rural deficit cause or lead to urban expansion? I'm wondering if you could elaborate uh, more on whether there is a causal logic here. Yeah, sure. It's it's quite straightforward. Um, so the new socialist countryside campaign um, was started in two thousand six as a way to modernize um, modernize the countryside, 
And what it did was it created matched funds to subsidies so that um, any rural government that was able to, you know, meet certain uh, specifications, like, for example, how many people they could convert to from rural to urban huko in a specific region, for example, um, if you could meet those sort of specifications, then you could receive uh, central state subsidies in order to build uh, necessary infrastructure for urbanization, for example, aquifers, highways, roads, etc. And so this became a large boon to uh, rural governments that had, you know, if you look at deficits across regions, rural governments have by and large much higher deficits than urban governments. And that's for several reasons. Like one is the gutting of rural industries in, in 1994 due to privatization. Another is the abolition of the rural household tax, the agricultural tax in 2006. Um, and then another is that a lot of these social expenditures that are being funded at the local level, for example, education until 2009 was largely funded by local governments. Now it's been centralized and the federal government pays a lot more. Um, but you know, same with health and other sort of social expenditures, a lot of these were really largely being borne by, um, by rural governments. Um, and so then they would turn toward urbanization. And what urbanization provided was um, several things. Number one, it provided those matched fund subsidies from the central state. And this new socialist countryside really marks the first time that central government has promised to feed more subsidies into the rural economy than it's extracted from the rural economy. Like historically, the relationship between the state and the peasantry really has been one of extraction, right? Um, and then number two, once these local governments can um, qualify for new socialist countryside campaign kind of um, subsidies, they, they're also then allowed to um, expropriate rural land um, um, and then process land transfer fees, which are usually paid by private developers using the land. And these land transfer fees are administrative fees that allow um, governments to convert collective rural land back to state ownership. They're highly, they're very exorbitant. They're, they constitute now a, a huge percentage of local government revenues. So the more land they expropriate, the more money they get, regardless of how that land is used and what value it generates after urbanization. Um, and then a third form of revenues that they can collect through urbanization is simply the taxes and fees from commercial development of that land. So if you're building an agribusiness, that agribusiness then generates profits for the government through you know, taxes. Um, if you're building real estate, again, you know, generates profits through taxes, et cetera. So those three forms of um, revenue streams really constitute kind of this new kind of capital accumulation by local governments through uh, the commodification of rural land. And yeah, I mean, I think that, um, this sort of trend or this phenomenon whereby uh, rural governments are more highly indebted than urban governments um, has really accelerated the use of urbanization and the use of this new socialist countryside campaign as a way of generating revenues rather than as a way of modernization. For example, a lot of local governments have um, urbanized but then not actually provided enough. They've been suppressing welfare programs and reducing the kind of, um, entitlements or reducing the amount of subsidies given through uh, a lot of social programs and reducing the amount of public housing that they build for landless rural people, for example. So this is kind of an example of how urbanization is sort of more about servicing rural debts, government debts, than it is about sort of modernizing the countryside. Thank you so much, Julia. I think that's a very, very uh, clear answer to, to the question. And uh, it's very difficult to explain such a complicated model in a few minutes, but uh, this makes perfect sense to me. Uh, Xinru, I have a question for you from the audience. Um, Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this comes from uh, Yue Lu He, a PhD student in sociology from University of Barcelona. Um, you have a question for Sino and Julia, both of them. Um, okay, question for Sino here is, uh, I'd like to know more about the interactions between e-ethnic females with Han and other ethnic uh, males. Uh, 
Uh, more specifically, do the E females have aspirations to marry or kind of um, uh, kind of have relationships with other ethnic males, especially uh, the ones who have urban residents, uh, which can potentially change your life trajectories. I think this is somehow addressed uh, slightly by your presentation in a way that you mentioned that E ethnicities tend to have very closed marriages. And I guess the audience is wondering whether working in the, the city in the factory kind of changes such attitudes towards their marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, shall I respond now? Yes, yeah. please, if you can. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, firstly, there are very few urban migrants, you know, who receive the urban hukou uh, after they come back to, uh, yeah, come out to work in cities. Um, there are, but most of them are brokers. Um, so that's why I think, uh, um, yeah, it's it's really hard to observe those who get urban city citizenship and you know get married with um, uh, with Han woman among the group of uh, informants I study. But I know the more um, higher educated and the better you know job position actually bring more uh, at an E woman, perhaps not migrant workers the, to to the uh, to the to an open you know uh, marriage relationship i mean uh, a, a relationship with um, han chinese or other ethnic group so it's not very uh, close among the good educated higher class people perhaps recently uh, but among the low class the migrant workers they still are very strictly controlled in the uh, in their own um, marriage system. Um, um, basically all the migrant workers I met, uh, they return back home to marry. They're mates from the same ethnic group. Uh, slightly the boundary between you know, clans, different clans uh, and um, black and society uh, and whitey has been come uh, be a little bit um, yeah, relaxed. But, but still, I think inter-ethnic group marriage is very significant amount group of migrant workers there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have two questions that uh, that's, that's both for Julie and Xinrong, well, kind of respectively, but coming from the same um, um, person. So Yun Peng Zhang from the uh, University of Leuven, um, thanks, thank you both speakers for such interesting talk. I have two questions. Um, first to Julia, to what extent do you think the tightening control of public debt might affect uh, China's current accumulation model and by extension uh, the patterns of labor exploitation by extending the patterns of labor exploitation and value extraction? It's a very packed question. Uh, for Xinrong, um, the same audience has a question that I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on the roles of state in producing, reproducing labor precarity. Both questions are dealing more with the, from the perspective of the state, from government, and it's it's quite big. You can choose a perspective to, I guess, to dive in. Julia, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, by tightening controls on public debt, I'm not quite sure what that means, um, but I, I think that they're referring to the question is referring to um, more regulations on local government financing vehicles that have been taking out debt on behalf of construction industry or on behalf of private developers in a sublegal way in order to um, kind of urbanize beyond the level of demand, um, and then. Possibly also this refers to kind of the red line that the central government has placed on the number of, of amount of land that can be expropriated for urban construction um, per year per province. So there's been a lot of a lot of attention paid to the fact that this has led to this overheating number one, um, like uh, local governments have been taking out more and more loans um, through these kind of sublegal um, 
low government financing vehicles, which are public-private partnerships. They're, 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 they're companies actually that have been formed as shell companies in order to fund construction on the behalf of local governments, because local governments always profit from urbanization, whether properties sell or not. So this led to this huge urbanization bubble in, in, in essence, this overheating kind of housing bubble, overheating real estate boom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's probably what the question refers to. In that case, yes, I mean, I think that um, there's been a number of reforms made in order to uh, sort of, number one, reduce the number of grievances among landless rural people, which have been rising and they peaked in 2013. Um, one is that there has been new land reforms passed in 2014 or so, um, which allow farmers to contract their own land. Um, in some places, this is an experimental policy that's only been rolled out in around 44 counties or so. In some cases, their uh, farmers are allowed to even use their land, contract their land directly to private developers for urban construction without going through the state. And so this allows farmers to collect a larger cut of the dividends from urbanization than they had been allowed previously. Previously, when you lost your land as a farmer, you just received a state appointed compensation fee. Oftentimes this was really low uh, and it was a one-time fee, which was expected to just kind of cover a lot of these ongoing new costs that farmers now face. They now have to purchase food from the market rather than you know, uh, growing it themselves. They now have to purchase housing and pay rent, whereas before they were able to, you know, construct their own housing on their own land, um, which been sort of given to them under this socialist land regime. So um, yeah, so it's led to some reforms, some land reforms, although a lot of scholars like Joel Andreas and Xiao Hua Zhan have actually showed that, you know, these new land reforms are actually um, being used by cadres and big household farms and agribusinesses to pressure farmers in order to um, take away, uh, to contract to agribusinesses their land use rights. Um, and so rather than empowering farmers, they're actually leading to more and more land transfers away from farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, the revision of the new socialist countryside campaign into the new urbanization plan in 2012, I think, that was meant to ameliorate the to, to also address these new rising rural grievances um so more attention was being paid to the welfare of rural people um so there's been some attempt to the central state by the central state to curb the kind of overheating um urbanization and to also counter its deleterious effects on rural people but i would argue that you know by and large a lot of these are half measures mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's also ongoing debate whether the in the um, last few years the um, concentrated residence or what do we call it, concentrated settlement is actually something that local government should continue to promote since many villages have been tearing, tearing down old houses and moving all the villages to a cent centralized point. And this has also called, been causing uh, issues and grievances. And I think last week, um, there are newspapers released by state uh, media to question, finally, to question the problems behind such, uh, such policy. So yeah, I guess it's an ongoing process and um, it's, it's um, important to keep following these changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, sorry, Julia, did you? Oh, I, I just wanted to add really quickly that, yeah, I mean, this is the, the major implication for labor recruitment, I guess, mm -hmm. is that the native village structure is really what allowed um, the kind of forms of trust and reciprocity that were necessary in order for labor recruitment through these brokerage networks to work. And so now that villages are being reconstructed and new borders are being drawn and now people are being concentrated in these artificial townships, um, labor brokerage has become a lot more tenuous. A lot of more labor brokers are doing what Boss Bo does and recruiting from villages very far away where they do not have many land and many kind of kin relations and trust and reciprocity relations to rely on. Mm -hmm. And so I would expect there to be you know, a kind of a rise in labor, labor related grievances as well as land related grievances as a result. Yeah, definitely as you explained in the lending case that farmers without this subsistence uh, farming and those kind of support from uh, their land is going to pose challenges to the uh, brokerage system. Yeah, we look forward to your next paper then. <laughs> Cyril, sorry, I took too much of your time. Do you want to answer to the question?
Uh, yeah, I, I think it's really a good question um, about yeah, how state uh, function in terms of uh, the labor uh, precarity. I, yeah, actually, I, I, I write in my paper on the China information, which I show that uh, state, the, the local states in Dongguan actually uh, reached to uh, a large group of uh, ethnic he leaders. Uh, you know, uh, mostly they are uh, big brokers running a big labor agencies. Uh, actually, the states expect uh, um, local, you know, uh, brokers to manage um, some of those um, labor disputes, which happens among the ethnic key migrant workers. So basically, they are trying to establish a kind of a patronage relationship by providing some kind of a small material benefits or some informal, you know, political positions for, to the uh, broker, uh, the, the big boss, the big brokers, and hopefully um, the government hope they can actually control those kind of, um, yeah, collective actions. Um, but actually I found oftentimes um, this didn't uh, success. Uh, in the long, long, uh, in the short term, actually, some broker do function to help government uh, to, yeah, to keep the workers, uh, yeah, under control. But in the long run, many of them find actually they are really expected to uh, perform their, you know, ethnic risk, uh, uh, obligations. If they don't, they have, they couldn't really fund, um, yeah, bring worker out. So I think. There's a tricky thing, um, yeah, among the group of uh, ethnic key workers. But I, my, my suggestion is actually not to reach to only uh, brokers, but really the the welfare, the you know the situation of, of uh, migrant workers should be really concerned by the government, not really push them to a precarious status, but really uh, help them to get a good benefits or to you know to connect to the uh, better uh, employment uh, positions things like that yeah more things should be done yeah yeah for those who want to learn more i mean i put um the link of Sino's article in the chat because i happen to have it on my web browser. I mean, um, it's a great article where you can learn more about how local governments deal with labor disputes. And especially it kind of links to the ongoing kind of um, stability maintenance uh, policy that local governments all have to try to make sure they don't have too many collective actions and protests. Uh, just under their nose. So uh, yeah, thank you. Sino. I want to maybe give last minute uh, before we close up the seminar to both of you whether you if you had any comments for each other or if you want to say a few words about your um, observation of the subfield of the scholarship on labor bro uh, brokerage if you have observed any uh, new trends or you think uh, there are certain things you have been uh, seeing both in your own research and other people's research that you want to comment on maybe it'd be a nice way to kind of conclude our seminar today julia do you want to go first um i mean i don't have I mean, I think that labor brokerage is something that's usually overlooked um, in studies of labor. Usually studies of labor focus on the point of production, right? Like disciplining and exploitation at the point of production, et cetera. But I actually think that the formation of a labor market relies more on how labor is even brought into markets in the first place. And there are a lot of relations of precarity as um, as Sinaron's presentation really elegantly exposed that that actually precede the formation of the labor market. And so it's important to pay attention to these, I think, not only because, you know, they're, they're tragic and um, sort of, uh, in, a, on, in a human way, extremely important for us to not look away from, but also because I think they have large implications for the character of like labor, of labor markets once they're formed and, and how they work. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great comment, Julia. Um, Siron, did you want to say something? Um, 
Yeah, uh, actually, I learned uh, a lot from Julia's uh, talk and her book. And actually, I think it's quite important to do a comparative study if I have an opportunity to do it in my future uh, study. Um, but also, I, I hope more you know researchers um, could join in the study of minority migrant workers in yeah in the future. And um, right now, I'm looking at um, international labor migration, <laughs> yeah, the uh, domestic um, labor migrants to China. I think it's also a very um, specific way to look at the uh, um, labor brokerage, how it functions between different countries and how it works in the, um, you know, uh, underground like uh, illegal yeah, channels. So I'm quite, yeah, I hope I have the, yeah, the uh, opportunity to bridge the internal and international migration uh, in the more future. But yeah, and if I'm, I'm really appreciate all the, yeah, the, the uh, invitations and uh, and Julie uh, Julia Star Union's um, um, yeah discontents very helpful. Thank you so much, Xinrong. You know, we have to close up now. Uh, Xinrong, you know, we all look forward to reading your new research and Julia as well. The audience, um, I have to say, if your questions haven't been read, um, then we will send your comments and questions to both speakers. And you're of course welcome to uh, check on their ongoing research and you're welcome to contact us or contact them directly to have more uh, direct exchanges. Uh, so I think I have to conclude our seminar now. I thank you for both speakers for your uh, fascinating, insightful talks. Uh, Heidi, I don't know, I'm not sure whether you have something to conclude, yeah? Okay, well, um, it's getting late in Beijing time and uh, thank you all for your participation and I had a great time. I hope you too. Um, see you soon. See you in our next seminar. Thank you for having us. Thank you.